Hey Yo from the Kingdom of Ohio. I am Ryan Peverly, and this is the Detox Podcast. Flooding your ear holes at 432 hertz. You already feel it. I know you do. Welcome to the Deep Program. In this episode, I am chatting with Veda Austin, a New Zealand water researcher, public speaker, and author of the recently released book, The Secret Intelligence of Water. Veda has dedicated the last eight years to observing and photographing the life of water. She believes that water is fluid intelligence observing itself through every living organism on the planet and in the universe. I'd probably argue the use of the word planet there, but this is Veda's bio, not mine, and we will get to that debate in future episodes, believe me. Veda's primary area of focus is photographing water in its state of creation, the space between liquid and ice, which we will discuss, one of my favorite parts of the chat. And after reading her book and seeing her work, I have to agree with Veda's sentiments and observations. Water is... Well, it's a creator, maybe even the creator, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Just a couple of notes before we get going here. First, the audio is just okay. Zoom sucks, and this is the last time I'm using it for these interviews. So good riddance to Zoom and their CCP surveillance system. Another note, from here on out, all episodes will be two hours in length. First hour free, second hour for paid subscribers on Substack. More on that after the chat, but just wanted to note that since I have your attention up front here. Also, while I have your attention, if I had to describe the conversation you're about to hear in just one word, it would be sex. This chat was pure sex. And I think Veda would actually agree with me. It started off rather innocuously, a little foreplay, and once we got into it, it just built and built and built and built and built with more vulnerability, more intimacy, just how I like it, right up to the final climax. So if you stick with it, you too shall be rewarded. I know I enjoyed it, and I know Veda did too, and now it's your turn. Enjoy. Veda Austin, thank you so much for being here and taking the time. I really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to imprinting your consciousness with hopefully a fun and lively conversation. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to that too, and thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. So you're the author of The Secret Intelligence of Water, which is a fascinating look at the art, science, and consciousness of water. And I can't wait to meet at that crossroads and that intersection of your work and talk about those three things. But before we do, I'm a sucker for like a good, how did you get to this point story? So when did you first discover that there was more to water than just something you drink sort of routinely throughout the day? And, you know, when did your intellectual and scientific curiosity about this subject begin? Well, around about eight years ago, so around the same time that Masaru Emoto's work came out, at a similar time, a friend of mine, uh, his name is Laurent Costa, he's a French photographer of water. His book called Journey into the Heart of Water also was released. Now, the commonality between these two pioneers is that they were looking at water crystals through a microscope and photographing what they saw. And the difference was that Masaru Emoto essentially was showing us water crystals in contrast. As you, I'm sure, and many of your listeners would know, say, for example, one cup had the word love on it, one cup had the word hate on it and the same water was in both and then he would flash freeze a tiny amount of that and see how the crystals formed and the crystals that were from the cup of love formed beautiful shapes that looked much like a snowflake and the water from the cup of hate failed to form structure. Now Laurent Costa didn't feel that the need or desire to actually influence water with words or with anything. He simply wanted to allow water to reveal whatever it wanted. And by doing that, he was really saying, and he, he told me this personally, that water is his spiritual teacher. He wanted to learn from water in whatever capacity it wanted to reveal itself. And he was getting microscopic photographs of smiley faces and hearts and fish and that intrigued me so much because for around about 15 years, I worked 
professionally as a, an oil painter, as an artist. I did big oil on canvas paintings for hotels and restaurants and companies and design stamps for New Zealand Post. And so I see the world through a very artistic lens. So for me personally, there was a quite a big difference between seeing geometries compared to actual imagery that made me see things in a slightly different way. So when I see a heart, to me, that impacts me differently than when I see a, a geometry. When I see a smiley face, it's even more intimate. It's relative to something that I see on people's faces that makes me want to smile. And so I found that these were very curious, very interesting. I really wanted to discover for myself if water had the ability to store information and share it as it froze. But there was another person who inspired me, and really it all kind of happened threefold with these three particular people. And this third person, his name was Thomas Hieronymus. He was a radionic engineer. And he mentioned in one of his observations of life that when he went to a Parisian meat market, he observed that the freshly placed organs of an animal appeared to be affecting the way the frost froze on the glass behind them. For example, the liver organ seemed to affect the way the frost froze into the shape of a liver organ behind on the glass. And the same thing with the heart, etc., etc. And his idea was that there seemed to be some kind of life force energy still emanating out of the organ, even though it was no longer attached to the animal. And he believed that that was because there was water in the blood. And even Rudolf Steiner talks about and suggests to his students to observe the way the frost freezes on a butcher's window compared to a florist's window, and you'll see that it's quite different. And that inspired me because Hieronymus's observations were macroscopic compared to the other two, of which were all microscopic. And back then, I didn't have a microscope, but... I had my iPhone and I had a Petri dish, which I was using for some other things. And so uh, I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to see what water might reveal to me. And so I had zero attachment to any outcome at all. I put some water into my Petri dish, which was glass, not plastic. And my idea was that I would project a thought or something into the water because it seemed that consciousness played a big role in the way that water could receive information because we are bodies of water by molecular count, not by volume. We're 99% water and there are more water molecules in our body than stars in the Milky Way. So the fact that consciousness flows through us and through this body of water, it kind of made sense that it could impact the water inside my Petri dish. So before I got to really think of anything specific, I noticed there was a little bit of fluff floating around in the water in my Petri dish. So I was like, oh God. So I put my hand in to take the fluff out. But I consciously thought, I wonder if my hand will have any impact on the water's quote-unquote memory. Then I just put it into the freezer and forgot about it for a little while. And the secret seems to really be in the freezing. When you look at Emoto and Laurent Costa and Thomas Hieronymus, all of what they have seen and, and had been revealed was shown as water had frozen. So I really knew that freezing was the way to go. When I pulled my Petri dish out, I held it up to the light and I just about fell over. And honestly, it was kind of freaky when it happened because there was an image of a hand in the ice that took up half of the Petri dish. And it was absolutely not what I expected. I really didn't think that I would see anything much more than the regular lines that you would see in ice. But there was this undeniable hand. And this part of my, my mind was like, oh, this, this is kind of crazy. I wonder if it's just me that thinks that looks like a hand. But I took it and I showed my son and I said, hey, Rama, what does this look like to you? And he didn't know what it was or what I'd done. I just showed him the photo on my phone and he said, it's a kind of creepy hand, mom. <laughs> I'm like, I know, it kind of is. And so then I was inspired to go down to the beach. I lived um, close to the beach at that time and I got a a layer of, of seawater, which I placed in my Petri dish. And I thought of water that might be just naturally informed with life, essentially. It's got to be seawater. So I took that and I froze that. And when I pulled that out, 
I observed this incredible fish with fins and a perfectly round eye and tail and the outline of its body. And it really was in that moment that my freezer became my most used household appliance. And I started doing this over and over and over again, using different influences, using all different kinds of stuff, and also allowing water to just... That sounds so... (laughs) It sounds like I have some control of water. I will state, water is wild, and I love it that (laughs) way, and it likes to stay that way. I say I allow it to reveal itself. It's, It's actually more about simply being in a place of curiosity rather than dominance. But sometimes it's easy just to to use certain words so we understand what I'm talking about. (laughs) But So that's kind of what began my journey with this. I now have over 16,000 photographs of water responding in this intelligent, artistic manner. And I've also developed my technique over these years. So rather than completely freezing water, I now only freeze my water for just under five minutes. And I've discovered that there are two types of water in water, informed water and uninformed water. And the informed water adheres to the bottom of the glass petri dish and creates this incredible crystallography on the bottom of the dish. But the uninformed water stays liquid on the surface for much longer. And I tip away the uninformed water and I photograph the informed water which has turned to ice and it's so much clearer it gives you much more clarity and it actually it looks gives you more of a 3d look so when i look back at my work that i did for around about a year and a half i totally froze water completely and i was still getting imagery when i look back at that it's amazing to me that i got the images that i did when i now see how easy it is to get this other kind of imagery Yeah, and that's a great introduction and overview of your work. And we're going to dig more into that for sure. Before we do, though, I'd like to ask people tough questions. But sometimes the toughest questions are also the most basic questions to ask. And I'm curious, like, because I thought about this for years when I first started to get into uh, Dr. Gerald Pollack's work with the fourth phase of water. It seems like a philosophical question on some level, too. But I just want to ask you, you know, because I don't know the answer, but what actually is water? Like when we look at it, we think that it's a liquid that we can, you know, like I said, that we can drink every day and it gives us sustenance and nutrition and hydration. But it goes way beyond that, I think. And I don't really have a definition for it anymore. I would actually say, just from my observations and all the work I've been doing all of this time and looking at it from the threefold that I do, which is the, the science, the art and the spirituality or the conscious aspect of things, what I see water as is a fluid consciousness. I say that because everything that is alive, everything that is living, has some form of of kind of consciousness, not in the way that we brand consciousness with the human yardstick, but in the way that trees, that plants, that animals, that everything that has a heartbeat and lives essentially in the way that we think, or everything that has the ability to grow and multiply, or anything that has these gifts, they all have an innate intelligence and purpose. And the seed holds all of this incredible knowledge within it, but when it gets light and water, that's when it will grow into something unexpected. If if someone came along a seed and had never known that a tree came from a seed, that would seem unbelievable that that magical thing could happen. So when I have observed water, and because I see that I'm getting responses in water, I can't say that I'm talking only from my personal perspective, obviously, but because I've seen water literally respond in an intelligent manner far beyond what anyone could imagine, I'll get into my later work now, like the work I've been working on that I call hydroglyphs is like next level intelligence within water. I am literally reading water in the ice. There are symbols that actually have meaning that I've identified, and I'll talk more about that soon. But all of these things lead me to believe that water is a type of fluid intelligence, and when it's within a body, it seems to hold and store memories. And I think of water as the observer. And when it's married with salt, 
I find that it stores memories. And I think that memories, we have all these memories within us and we can hold them because salt is a crystal and crystals we use in all of our technology to store vast amounts of information. Salt and water is this liquid crystal and that's what we are. We're like these liquid crystal solar panels absorbing light and charging up and essentially there is a consciousness within us that we're able to observe ourselves. We consider that to be the equivalent of what consciousness is, is this awareness of ourselves. But it's not to say that any other creature doesn't have some kind of awareness. So someone once said to me, what if water is essentially observing itself from every single different perspective and basically using every single animal, person, tree, and every other thing, and filling that with its own consciousness to kind of observe itself. The ultimate observer of oneself in every different perspective is a very interesting thing, but that's also what I see because water comes within us and leaves us. So when you drink a glass of water, that water's been through the clouds and the trees and the animals and the plants and the earth and your ancestors, you're essentially drinking an essence, all those life forces. So I think of water as a life force, but I personally think of water as fluid and consciousness. Well, it's interesting that you said water is wild, and I think its natural state is in motion, right? It's constantly in motion. It's constantly moving, or at least it it wants to, right? I think that's what you were kind of maybe getting at by saying it's wild. And, you know, we're tossing around this term, you know, it has consciousness, it has intelligence, and I think you kind of were hinting around this idea in your response there. But I think what we're really saying, too, is that it's self-aware. Like water itself is self-aware. It's aware of itself, right? I also thought it was interesting that every time you kind of look into a body of water, or maybe even just your glass of water, you always see a reflection. It's always yeah. reflecting something back at you, which is yourself, right? Absolutely. That's why when I, when I go into schools and I teach a combination of, of water science and, and art to children between the ages of 8 and 10, and I say one of the ways in which we see that we are water is when we look into each other's eyes. Our eye lens is 99% water and you can see your reflection in another person's eyes. And so water really is the the mirror to your soul. That's why they say that eyes are the mirror to the soul. It is not a coincidence that, that there is that saying. And I think that water, for me, it's more around getting to understand that when you stop seeing water as just something that you drink and you bathe in and you do all of these things, when you stop and look in a puddle and actually see how it's reflecting and you're looking into it and you see water reflecting you, we think we're just looking at it, but what if it's looking at us? What if it is in, it has the ability in its observer state to see us, not with the physical eyes, but in a different kind of way. If we imagine what consciousness looks like, not many people can say, I think consciousness looks like X, Y, and Z, because we have a vague idea of consciousness. We don't see it as a thing. But what if it's actually potentially right in plain sight, in the air, because water is in the air, in the lakes, in the rivers, in the streams, in everything we drink, and within every living body on this planet and many others, I'm sure. Water is also in the universe. So when we think about it in those terms, water takes another kind of, you get to see water in a new way. And we are so attached to this physical body because we move around it when we look in the mirror that we've created, the glass mirror, and we see ourselves, we see this physical body. But whenever we have a an intense emotion, whether it's really happy or really sad, water reminds us of what we are. When we cut ourselves, we leak. When we go to the bathroom, we leak. We are these only ever just like a sweat away (laughs) or an emotion away or various other things away from liquid and yet we never really think about ourselves in that way because we're encased in this skin that that hides these moving fluids. They say to the children, if your skin was invisible and your organs were see-through, what would you look like? And we would see what living streams and tributaries and rivers we really are. 
we are like a living aquarium. And so it's very interesting how we have disconnected from ourselves as bodies of water because of the way in which we see. So if we were to suddenly be able to see water as, as it sees us, I think that we would see the entire world and all life in an entirely different way. Because I see that water sees many things in a different way than we do. For example, one of the hydroglyphs that I was talking about, this is work that I've been doing where to get one hydroglyph, I had to have used the same influence at least 50 times and seen the same result at least 50 times in the ice to say I have one hydroglyph. So it's not coincidental. I know that that particular ice image means this. Similar to hieroglyphs, these hydroglyphs almost overlap with hieroglyphs in that they have layered meanings. And it's very complex work. This has been something I've been working on for three years, and I only have 30 hydroglyphs. It takes a long time. But it is so worthwhile. Someone who was dying reached out to me and said, can you please see what water reveals when you use the word death? So I have a hydroglyph for living, for life. And that is a hydroglyph that looks like a very, very large hexagon shape. It almost takes up the whole Petri dish. What was very interesting is then when I used the word death, it showed me the exact same hydroglyph for life. It was as if water didn't recognize death in the way that we do. And another person that I've been teaching how to do this work, he did the same thing. He basically asked the water, to reveal its version of death. And rather than get the hexagon, which is life or living, he got what I call the lung glyph, which means to breathe, breathing. So essentially, what his glyph meant was death is breath. So it was as if water is seeing us and showing us and telling us these very deep insights through this way of understanding this fluid intelligence that I'm talking about because it's always about trying to see things from the perspective of the fluid intelligence that's outside of the body I think we've got so that's why I get excited when other people start learning how to do this because it appears to be a universal language of which this man was in India I've got another person somewhere in Russia that's doing this too and we're seeing these same glyphs show up as I've been teaching them about it. And what we're seeing and reading is truly remarkable and profound. Yeah, and you describe these hydroglyphs too as a non-spoken language that has a direct connection to the heart. I thought that was an interesting way to think about it and to talk about it. But could you maybe talk a little more about that? What do you mean by that it has a direct connection to the heart? A good example... I think is when you read a text message or an email and we read the words and we understand what the message is about. But at the end of that message, somebody might use the modern day hieroglyphs, which are termed as emojis and put like a heart emoji at the end. Nobody writes at the end of their message heart. They use a image, a picture. And that heart image kind of gives you the feeling of, oh, that's really sweet. It gives you a feeling. It isn't necessarily a, a mental thought that happens straight away. It, that heart image means something to you. It kind of touches you in a different way than writing does, in the same way that art does. When you go into a gallery, you are going into the gallery and seeing, what does this image mean to me? What does this picture feel to me? We go into a, a different space. I mean, you can look at how the artist has used their paintbrush in certain ways or, you know, what their technique is. You can look at all those things. But art is meant to be appreciated through the eyes and into the heart. You buy art because, A, there's an amazing story behind it that's made you feel something. Or, B, you just think it's beautiful and it touches you in some way and it has, it, it has impacted you not just mentally but emotionally. So by looking at images, 
and recognizing that they are sharing an entire concept because ultimately that's kind of more of what hydroglyphs are trying to share an entire concept and hieroglyphs do the same thing they're images that that have can have multiple meaning i recently learned that hieroglyphs actually can be read in all directions hieroglyphs can be read from the left to the right right to the left from up top to bottom and bottom to top which is unlike any other kind of language we've ever seen so when i'm looking at these hydroglyphs these glyphs that appear in the ice and i start to see that they have meanings and multiple meanings i get a sensation from them by seeing them that actually touches me in a way and and reveal it's, it's almost as if it's speaking directly into your conscious awareness of of life not just your mental awareness of life and so there is this kind of sensation that comes from these images that you see and you usually feel more when you do them yourself because they're usually directly for you and you're feeling that there is another type of consciousness that is understanding you and your life your past and your present and your future because i've observed over and over that water isn't limited to just showing us things that are happening in the present time i often see water showing me images that have happened a hundred years ago and sharing information of things that are about to happen. For example, one man in the private group that I have for people that actively using my technique and doing this work, his daughter did one of these tests with water and she had two glyphs show up. The stairway glyph, which basically originated from the song Stairway to Heaven. I was doing repeat studies on different kind of genres of music. So with Stairway to Heaven in every single ice image that I did, and I've done that multiple times, I would always see a stairway, like a staircase. And I got to wondering, does that staircase or that stairway, does that mean stairway or, or could it mean something more than that? So I started to write the word stairway and Sure enough, I would get the stairway appear in the ice. And then I thought, well, could it mean more than that? So what do we do with a stairway? We, we tend to climb up. And so I wrote climb up and I kept getting the stairway. So I now have a, a twofold meaning for the glyph stairway. It means stairway, but it also means to climb up. So that stairway was in her ice image, but she also had two dagger glyphs and the dagger glyph originated because people kept asking me if, if water could understand different languages and would it reveal something from a different language that I'm not overly familiar with. And it has done that multiple times. So I used a Latin. I put the word Pugioni. I wrote it on a piece of paper, put my Petri dish of water on top of it for 30 seconds. I choose 30 seconds just because I like the number. I think it doesn't have to be anywhere near that long because water seems to know what I'm going to do before I even do it. But that's because I've had years and years of building this kind of relationship. And then I would see this dagger in the ice. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then I did that multiple times, more than 50 times. I kept seeing daggers. Like, okay, I know it means dagger. But then I was well, got to mean something else because I kept seeing the dagger glyph and other work I was doing. And I'm like, I'm not seeing daggers everywhere I go. What, what does that mean? And so I was thinking, well, what does a dagger do? I mean, it's, it's inflicting pain. So could it mean emotional, physical pain? And sure enough, the dagger kept showing up with those words. And then I thought, well, could it mean danger? It seemed like a logical next thing to, for my mind anyway, and I kept getting the dagger glyph for danger. So that whole layered meaning of learning about that dagger glyph took me a year <laughs> to do all, to over understand all those layered meanings of it. However, when I saw two daggers and a staircase or a stairway in this girl's crystallography, I reached out to her dad and I said, could you just tell your daughter just to be careful if she's climbing up something? And the, the dad immediately responded and said um, that they the next day they were going to a place called Go Ape, which is like all about like climbing up these ladder things into the trees and kind of doing crazy stuff. He said, I'll make sure she's careful. My point of saying that was is that that message for that girl 
was for something that was about to happen. And that was such, as such an interesting idea that, that this intelligence, this sort of fluid consciousness of water that I'm seeing every day, playing with every day, appears to be able to give us these kind of messages because it isn't limited to this linear time that we understand. So I'm curious then, like, to go back to a more foundational question here. You've said in this chat, you've said in your book too, that water reveals its information in the freezing process. I'm curious, like, if you understand or overstand, right? Like, uh, <laughs> what is it about this transitional phase here between, you know, like liquid to ice that is so special, like, about that phase, you know? Like, what have you learned just from maybe studying, you know, uh, Marcel Vogel's work, which I know you're familiar with, because he talks about that stage too. He calls it the liquid crystal lyotropic mesophase. It's a mouthful to say, <laughs> but... But this is this transitional phase. And what do you know about that? And what is it about that phase that really allows the water then to, I guess, capture this information? Mm -hmm. I like that question. So one of the reasons that I changed my technique was based around Dr. Pollock's work around the fourth phase of water. And what I began to understand, as you've just talked about, something special does happen between the stage of liquid and ice. So water goes from molecular chaos because in one glass of water, the molecules are moving and updating and their information a trillion, a trillionth, a trillionth of a second. It's hard to even fathom what that is. Water is in chaos in its movement state. Not that we see that. It looks like a very nice still glass of water, but in fact, there is so much, so much movement within the molecules. But as water slows down, as it freezes, it's starting to turn into more of a liquid crystal. And so water that has frozen naturally, like snowflakes, for example, are actually termed as a mineral. So that ice that is formed naturally in nature is actually considered to be a mineral because of the way in which its molecular structure is so ordered. So Jerry Pollock talks about how the molecular structure of water becomes more ordered and takes on the patterns, same patterns as a crystal does. But what makes that stage so powerful in between liquid and ice is that as it's beginning to form and become completely frozen, that's where all of the water molecules appear to be able to slow down and rearrange themselves. And while they're rearranging themselves, which is amazing in itself, to become a new phase, that in-between state is what I call the state of creation. Because what I'm seeing, and what I physically am seeing as well, is that I was inspired by that. So let's just start there by Jerry Pollock talking about this in-between stage between liquid and ice where water is more of a gel. It, it's a, quite a different capacity of this kind of ability to sort of be more stretchy and viscous. It absorbs more light. It has these different properties, right? So I started opening my freezer earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier because I'm like, I think I'm missing something here. I think that this totally frozen water it can sometimes be kind of cloudy. I feel like the imagery that I'm trying to see is being hidden once something is frozen completely. And so as I began to open the freezer earlier and earlier, I noticed that water appears to create this kind of, it is kind of like a gel. It starts to kind of extend these shoots out. It's kind of almost like it's like an invisible seed. It's like an invisible seed because the first thing you see water do is shoot out of a type of fern shape in these kind of lines. And then very, very quickly, and I've caught it on camera a couple of times, within seconds at a particular time, around about three and a half minutes, depending on your freezer setting, water will go from a liquid with a couple of those little shoots of ice and then you can watch it suddenly take off and take over the entire dish extremely fast and so watching that it came to realize that there is this stage where water suddenly takes off it suddenly becomes active and alive in a way we can't even imagine it's almost like it gets super creative and it's like it takes the information 
that it absorbed in its liquid state. And the, the molecules that were the most full of information appear to have the more of an ability to design first. So within that space, it's like most of that water has become this collective artist and starts to design in that space. It's a very thin layer of ice. So that very, very thin layer of ice, you can actually see when you photograph it, there is often this kind of um, liquid layer around the ice and you can see that that's that kind of fourth phase water because it, it has a slightly different uh, look about it, texture about it. Sometimes the water is actually looks, it looks like water, but it's actually ice. It's perfect fourth phase water that's still sticking to the petri dish, but it looks, when you photograph it, just as if it's liquid. But when you touch it, even though it will disintegrate essentially, kind of like melt away, you can see that you're looking at this fourth phase. So as I was doing this sort of opening the freezer and looking, I, that's where I discovered that water really does magical things within that phase. But once it's totally frozen, then it's sort of it's in a different state. If you catch it in that in-between state, that appears to be where water is capable of much, much more than we can imagine. My idea of how this is potentially working is that the water in its liquid state has taken on information as it begins to freeze. It takes that information and somehow intelligently designs because I know that there is a big difference between water that has not been inspired or influenced compared to water that has been inspired or influenced through various different means. So I did a lot of kind of two-year study for some people studying what the crystallography of various different waters looks like. And tap water is a great, great control water because it nearly always looks a certain way. It has a certain pattern. It has disordered lines and it's kind of all over the place. There's no real, no real kind of structural information there. Whereas spring water, for example, tends to form ferns. It forms hexagons. It forms flowers. It looks very beautiful. But you can take that tap water knowing what that tends to always look like and knowing that it's gone through piping and right angles and it's always got some kind of, well, not always, but most always it's got some kind of fluoride or chloride or chemicals in, within it. So you can take that water and then you can influence it in some way, for example, put it into a singing bowl and play it and then freeze it using this technique and water will form in an entirely new way. Water will start to take formative design and start looking more like it would have done if it was a spring or maybe its original you know, source was actually beautiful, I'm sure it was, and it's gone through all of this piping. But then you give it some kind of inspiration and it will change in its form. And so with it being able to do that, it does that in this freezing process. It only seems to do that in that, in that space between liquid and ice, where it has the ability to actually change structurally. And we can see that. I've seen that hundreds and hundreds of times because people ask me to do work for them for their vortexing machines or their various different kinds of um, water structuring devices and things like that. And I use tap water as my control and we are able to see major changes. The water chemically doesn't change, but it structurally changes. So that fourth phase of water is a very curious and interesting one. It's also very akin to the human body because our body converts H2O into H3O2, which is what Jerry Pollock talks about as the fourth phase of water. It can absorb more light. It um, expands even further with infrared light and it has, it's slightly more alkaline. It has this kind of different viscosity. It's more of a type of gel. And that's also what I see happen as it's beginning to freeze. There are times when you can almost touch the ice and it's definitely more of a gel than it is of an ice. And there is this magic. I, I keep saying that word, but not in, the, in a way in which the magicians are trying to like deceive us or show us like a, like a sleight of hand or anything. And in a very real magical way, it seems like water goes from just this liquid into this, these pitches, water becomes the artist. It's almost as if water always has the potential as a liquid, but when it starts to freeze, 
the inner artist comes out and it's almost as if lots of each each molecule is like an artist but they agree somehow <laughs> collectively to design and it's kind of like pixels for a photograph lots of little pixels it might not make much sense and you see them all together it creates a photo that's much like what I'm seeing and the uninformed water that I remove seems to just kind of be the type of ice that we would just see this kind of like fog over so that's why the imagery that I get now is so much clearer and that's why I'm still amazed that I got as much amazing imagery as I did when I began. You know what's great about talking to you about your work? You bring up so many interesting and thought-provoking things in just one answer to that very basic question that I throw at you. <laughs> and I have no idea like which flow to follow here because I just want to branch off into all these little tributaries of conversation and it's it's almost like it's almost a little chaotic, which is kind of <laughs> what we're talking about. So yeah. I like what you're saying like this in-between state that we were talking about, you know. It reminds me of like when you're just about ready to fall asleep, right? Yeah. Like it's yeah. like you're in that state where you're kind of hovering over a dream and that's the state that you're creating in. I think that's a good analogy. It's a fabulous analogy. I'm really glad you said that because that's exactly what it's like. It's like this slightly different space completely where water is given a, a different environment it's like when we're in a different environment, sometimes we behave differently. That in-between state where we're just starting to fall asleep, we are definitely in a different realm at that time. And we talk about the we, you know, who are we? It's just as big a question as asking what is water. It's like, who are we? And then it's like we say we are in this kind of in-between state. But what, what does that mean? Our conscious awareness is in that in-between state. If our conscious awareness is actually mostly water or water, then it makes sense that water would understand all different spaces and different phases and stages. I've done dream work, actually. I, I did eight weeks where every single evening I would leave a Petri dish of water beside my bed with the intention that it might capture something from my dreams. And I dream really regularly, and I usually remember my dreams. So in the morning, I would go and freeze the water and photograph it. And I've shared some of these images on my um, various social media pages. So, ex for example, one of my dreams was that I was in this boat. It was kind of like this crazy, weird-looking Viking boat. The waves were just so huge, and it just felt like this was going on forever, and I was feeling seasick. I'm like, i got to get out of here. This is going on and on. And when I, I woke up, I froze the water, and there was this, this boat um, with a mast, and it looked just like what I had dreamed with these giant waves. And then I had another dream where I was in a forest, and I heard this little sound. It sort of sounded like a squeaking, like a kind of cross between a squeak and a meow. And there was this cute little creature that was all silky and kind of looked like a cross between a puppy and an otter or something. I kind of went through these bushes and I saw its mother was feeding all these little baby things. I don't know exactly what the creature was, but it was really silky. And then I put the baby back with the mother and then I woke up. And in the ice, the image was so remarkable because it looked just like the mother with the babies. And several people said, oh, I thought it was actually a photo of, of an animal because you, you could barely see that it wasn't even, uh, that it was ice. It actually looked so realistic. And then I had been watching a, a Netflix series called Sweet Tooth. And in the introduction video part of it, there is this baby that looks half lion, half baby. And I dreamt about that particular image. And that was the image that showed in the ice when I woke up. And then there were some times where I actually forgot what I dreamt. And then the image in the ice reminded me of the entire dream. And so I've been speaking to someone on one of my advanced courses who has been studying dreams as a professor for the last 20 years. And he finds this just absolutely fascinating, this work, because it, it suggests to me that water in this Petri dish with the set intention that it captures some part of my dream is somehow connected to my subconscious. And as I go into that subconscious and into that dream state where we're seeing imagery, where we're on in a kind of like another dream life, it's observing what I'm seeing. 
and is able to reveal that in ice. And I'm not controlling that because in my waking state, there's a different energy, there's a different mind being used than when you're dreaming. And when you're dreaming, nobody ever says, I had the most normal dream the other day. It's always like, oh, I had this crazy dream the other day because dreams don't often make sense in the waking state, but they're perfectly normal in the dream state. And so I have have this idea, you know, that water is somehow able to observe what I'm observing, whether I'm awake or asleep. And that really interests me. And one of the things that we talked about in our in that advanced group was I suggested that perhaps the small group that of us could, before we go to sleep, leaving the water by the bed with that intention to capture the dream, hope that we can somehow dream about looking into water. Because if we're able to dream of looking into water, it invites water to not just stay the observer, but to actually be a participant in the dream and take us on a journey with it, which really interests me. So I'm excited to start doing that because where that can go, who knows? It's got so much potential. Yeah, I would say that's one of the more recent things that I've discovered about your work. Like you said, you've been sharing that on your Instagram and some other places. And I'm, yeah, I'm completely blown away by it. It doesn't take much for me to, you know, comprehend the artistic interpretations, you know, with words or intention or music or whatever. But then when we start getting into these other areas, like these more subconscious areas of dreaming, just the fact that this intelligence is able to pick up on that. I mean, it must never sleep then. Like, that's a conscious living organism. But water's not sleeping. It it seems to be always active then. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, really, when you think of the term omnipresent, which is so often used in terms for various terms for God, for example, there is this sense that there is definitely an omnipresence within the realms of water of which... Because it is every, it's everywhere within us. We always forget it's in the air as well. It's all these different stages. And so it's easy for us to forget about the fact that these words are getting spoken. Like the water within the air is picking them up. That's why words are so powerful. They're amplified as they go out of us. You know, they're going from one body of water out into another that just is a different stage. It's just, in a different form because we can't see it. We tend not to um, think about it in that way. But in fact, because water is in the air and because water could indeed be this fluid consciousness and even in the air, it is still in its fluid state. The only time it's not in that state is when it's fully formed into ice and then it's in a state of suspension. But within the, that ice, there's, if they look at the Antarctic core samples that they take, they look at all, and nature does that. Look at the rings in the tree. There are record keepers that are naturally formed, and those rings in the ice wouldn't be there if the water hadn't been present in the tree. And so water is always keeping records when it begins to freeze, as it's going through life, it's observing and recording. And so when you freeze it, what I'm seeing is is that it is recorded. And so it is that thing where when you take out the regular kind of consciousness that we have in our daily lives, and you put that same I don't like the word test, but, you know, when when we look at water and we we bring water into our dream state and we see that it has actually seen what we've seen. I mean, this is, to me, it's, I shouldn't be surprised, but I'm always excited. I'm always excited when I see what happens because I never know what water is going to do. Some people always say, well, is it just you? I mean, you must have some special relationship with water and it just must be revealing all of this stuff. I've just spent nearly every single day for the last eight years working with this amazing substance, this amazing intelligence, and giving it the reverence that it deserves. That's why I never say or really ever say that I'm experimenting because I'm a body of water that doesn't want to be experimented on and I give water the same respect. But the less I try to control things, the more I see. So that's why I think dreams work so well. I'm not controlling anything. 
at least I'm not consciously aware of it. Simply by intention, I'm inviting the water to share a journey with me and reveal what it's seen. The fact that I'm so out of control is the reason that it works so well, I believe. Well, yeah, and like you said, you're not experimenting, you're co-creating. That's really what it sounds like. <laughs> That's what I call it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. you've also said that water is not a resource, it is source. So exactly. it goes back to the idea of God and... You know, my idea of God, by the way, not to take this, you know, too far into that, but like it has changed and shifted so much over the years. And then I come across someone like you and your work, and it just makes me reconsider everything I think I know about, well, something that's probably not knowable to begin with, right? But maybe it is. Maybe it's a lot more knowable than we give it credit for. And it's not this abstract sort of idea that it is something just very simple. I mean, if we're all an expression of source and like an expression of creation and we're 99% water molecules, it, it might be safe to assume that, yeah, there might be something to the idea of God residing in every one of our cells already. And it's a literal, physical, tangible thing that we can actually observe. I mean, that is a, is a topic I love because there's so much to that, but there is a simplicity in the idea that water is divine. There is a simplicity in that because it is in every life force. And in fact, it's not just water itself that's in every living life force. It's the marriage of water and salt. And even when someone is cremated, the ashes are actually salts. We have two immortal things within this meat suit that are essentially water that doesn't die, you can pollute it. We can call it dead, but water will always evaporate. So we see it reincarnate before our eyes all the time. And salt, which is less talked about, salt is a crystal. And when it merges with water, we can't see it anymore. We can taste it. But when the water has gone and evaporated, the salts are still there and they can't even be burned in death. Water it will evaporate, but the salts remain. And so there is this really interesting marriage of salt and water and salt being able to potentially store those memories. And then when water is released from the body, it is given that opportunity to simply be the observer again. It's a very interesting concept around this idea that even in various different texts, various different religions and philosophies, there is this idea that God spoke upon the waters, so suggesting that the waters were there, that we are created from water, as suggested within the Quran. There is this idea of the impersonal and personal gods. For example, Nirvana, the Buddhists kind of go into the belly of God, into the, the nothingness, into the abyss, but also... When you look in the Vedic scriptures, they talk about all the different paths to God, and there are many. And you can go towards an impersonal God, or you can go towards a personal God. None are wrong. And it is this idea that I see in water. Water can be the impersonal, the formless, but water can also be the form. And it is the ultimate artist. And when you think about the all of how life is created, this is an artistic expression of what could be termed as love. This is an artistic expression from an incredible artist, this world and everything that's in it, the trees and everything that's there. And what what is it filled with? It's filled with water, everything, everything. And even upon death, quote unquote death that water doesn't recognize <laughs> within this area of these hydroglyphs that I do. It's water that will evaporate out of the body and the salts are what remains. And because I see two types of water in water in these petri dishes, informed and uninformed, I think there is probably two types of water in people. The type of water that we drink and that is excreted and it the kind of this flow that goes through. And then there's kind of an essence water, the sort of spiritual molecules that stay liquid within the body until the time of death that we understand death to be. And that essence of who we are, that I believe 
that goes from some kind of a liquid into some kind of vibrational vapor, not a stage that we've identified yet, or as we would see it, just as if it was steam, but because we over, only identified four stages of water so far, and there's quite a lot of different stages within ice even, but... I think that there is so much we don't know about water. It has so many anomalous properties. At least 70% of it on the surface of Earth, not including primary water, which is in the Earth's mantle, came essentially, it's believed that it came from asteroids and meteorites, making it an alien substance, of which we don't even know where it came from originally. So since we know so little about water, I think it's highly possible that water, the essence of water that is within us, that we actually, that gives us that conscious awareness, could transmute from a liquid into a, some type of vibrational vapor that vibrates so highly that we can't physically see it. And as a gas expands, it cools, which would explain why people feel spirit as cold. It would also explain and play into the idea of people that have had near-death experiences who have felt themselves rising, which gas does, and observing themselves, because if water is the observer, it doesn't need eyes like we think it does, to observe their body on the table and be able to, if they come, when they come back into their body, to tell everybody what happened and what they saw. To me, all of that just seems to make sense, because even within the different religious texts and different philosophical texts. There is, a, They say the spirit, soul, subtle body leaves the body, but no one explains how. So for me, it just makes sense that, that the water is the answer. Water is the, the way, it's the water way, <laughs> to, um, to the way in which the essence of who we are departs the physical body. You know, I was thinking of, as you were talking, I kept thinking of the phrase that you used earlier, when we were talking about that in-between state and how the molecules essentially move from chaos to order. And that that gives a really interesting new meaning to that phrase, order out of chaos, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it also made me think like physiologically, I don't know if you're familiar with this idea of cold therapy or cold thermogenesis where people, you know, plunge into ice baths or cold water as a means to heal themselves. And it got me thinking like, well, maybe that's why cold therapy is actually so effective is because it takes all those chaotic water molecules that are always in motion in your body and it just slows them down and it allows you to sort of recalibrate and facilitate that healing process. I don't know if you've done any research into that, but I think that's something that you can probably, you can gauge and test that on your body. You know, if you're suffering from some sort of malady, like you can do cold therapy and you can see yourself getting better. I've done that myself. So I didn't think about it in this way, though, until we're having this conversation. It's like, oh, yeah, my molecules are chaotic because they're constantly moving throughout my body. There's a constant flow right through my blood. And that makes sense that that in between state of like uh, liquid and ice, which we plunge ourselves into when we expose ourselves to cold temperatures you're blowing my mind here. That is exactly what's happening, I think. Mm-hmm. No, you're absolutely right. And I think even further than that, that that kind of stage, and when, even when you look at the at, at how we can freeze egg and sperm, we can, they can be frozen for years and years and years and then still be able to be valid and used. Where at that freezing process preserves life. It's almost life preserving. It is uncomfortable when we go into that cold plunging into that ice. It's uncomfortable, but it immediately makes us breathe differently. And it kind of comes into that breathing. We immediately have to breathe slower. Because it kind of, even when you just turn the cold shower on and you go from a nice warm shower, you're all comfortable, and you suddenly turn it into the cold shower, you kind of go, <gasps> And your breathing immediately changes. It forces you into this immediate kind of shift. And within that shift, it's that, how does that shift happen? What is physically happening and what is emotionally happening? Because they're all connected. And that idea that we are slowing down is actually so much of what we need, especially now in the world where there's everything is such so fast paced. It is so chaotic. 
and we can feel it. You can say to somebody, okay, that, that's feeling relaxed. We're just lying down or just like whatever and say, and then you can say, and now relax. And then you realize you're actually more tense. You didn't even realize you were tense. But when someone says, now relax, and you realize you can relax further and further and further, the idea that that slowing down process resets us. But the other thing I think is that if you were able to, if I would love to be able to create, have someone help me create like a giant Petri dish, which was able to have someone lie in that water and then it to be flash frozen. I think that this would be a way in which we could actually really gauge what's going on for people and see what their, their kind of body is telling us, not just through their consciousness, but through the entire body be participating within the water and seeing what we see. It would be a very curious and interesting thing to observe. But absolutely, uh, you're right. I think that that's one of the things that is happening and why it is so rejuvenating and why I think that people that have been in very, very cold climates throughout history, they have had to learn a great deal of skills and had to really become very intelligent very quickly to survive those cold climates. And so cold seems to inspire us to find ways to live comfortably in this world, to evolve in this world. It's interesting to see some of the some of those areas in the world many, many thousands of years ago where people had to figure out a way to survive. They had to develop quicker even. So it, it is uh, very interesting, the idea what ice has done for us, what cold does for us as people, not just internally, not just for our help us physically, but also that is inspired and help us mentally to find solutions for things. So I'm most curious, actually, about the emotional aspect of your work. You've said that that water has an emotional health. We've kind of talked to that already. It's an emotional mirror that reflects emotions back to us, which is what your work shows too. And I want to talk a little bit about your own emotional life and how you use that to capture how water could respond and did respond to what you were projecting emotionally into it. Yeah. I've used emotions many, many times because we're all moving bodies of emotions, really, as people constantly flowing in and out of different types of emotions. So many of the um, things that I've projected into water have come from an emotional state, whether it's a loving state where I'll see hearts or it's a state of anxiety or stress of which I'll see a very specific look in water which looks like spikes. And that's how stress feels to me. It feels prickly and spiky. So I was not shocked when I saw this kind of spikes that are very, very indicative of that feeling. And also I've spoken to water and that has been really interesting because I don't know what the answer is going to be. So I said to water, can you connect to my mum? And my mum passed away in 99, 1999. I used to live in Japan many moons ago before the days of like emails and all that kind of stuff. And we um, would write to each other in physical, actual letters. And at the end of every letter, my mother, who was absolutely terrible at drawing, <laughs> she, she would attempt to do some kind of circle and put a heart in the middle. And what was revealed to me was a misshapen um, circle with a heart in the middle that was so clear in the ice. And I didn't know that water would reveal that. And it was almost as if water was able to physically, I don't know if that's the right word, but able to, to, to allow or invite my mother's energy into that water source and it be actually a, a message. And I've done that for somebody else. I said, can you please connect to my friend's dad? And what was so curious about his particular one is that he's a big he's a big water guy and his birthday was coming up and he asked me, can you please leave a, a Petri dish or two out 
of water so that my friends can leave me birthday messages, send me birthday messages from around the world and project it into the Petri dish. And he wrote a post saying, can you all project, you know, your thoughts and wishes into this Petri dish in New Zealand? And I was happy to do that. We we did all of that, and he had an amazing response. But what he didn't know is that I'd done a another Petri dish where I'd uh, asked the water to connect to his dad who had passed away. And he didn't know I did that. What I had done is in these Petri dishes were the same amount of water, and I'd left them both overnight because he wanted as many people from around the world to be able to imprint the water with their wishes and thoughts and he had friends from all around the world. So we left it overnight. The Petri dish that was I had asked about his dad, the water had evaporated so much that it was a very thin layer of water that was left to freeze. And I thought that that was a very curious thing that had happened. When I froze it, the all of the water that was remaining had formed into a heart. There was no other part of the ice that remained. It was all made into a heart shape within that dish. And it was as if the spirit or the essence of his father had a either used the water as an energetic source to create this image, to send this message, or water had somehow had an exchange with the spirit, but somehow the water had, had disappeared. But some of it had gone. And that was a very interesting observation because I hadn't seen that before. So it made me very curious about how his dad had recently passed. And so maybe it was his dad who needed to, more energy to create a message. Whereas my mother had been gone, you know, nearly 20 years and she was well used to being in that kind of space. I don't know how that works. There is a lot of things I don't understand, and I'm quite happy to say that. I feel like I'm still learning every day when I'm doing this work. But I have um, this little story around the emotional aspect with water too, and that a while ago, some years ago, when I was working for some people, um, they thought my work was really amazing, and they really wanted to see if it could scientifically be proven in some way, shape, or form. And they had the scientist coming over from Canada. I think he was a microbiologist or something like that. And they said, look, would you mind just spending a little bit of time working on a project in your spare time, you know, with Vader? And so he, he did. And I explained my technique. I explained how I worked. I explained that consciousness was a part of this work. And I understood that might not be an easy thing to, you know, add into the equation. And he didn't want to add that into the equation at all. He wanted to see if water would do it in a very kind of clinical manner. So he said, well, look, if consciousness really is a part of this, then we, you can't be part of this experiment at all. We need, I don't want you to, to be part of it. I don't want you near the lab. You know, you stay far, far away. And I immediately started getting this anxiety because I'm like, oh my God, this water is going to be treated like a lab rat. I don't feel comfortable with this. It made me more and more uncomfortable. Anyway, what he did was that he got a petri dish of water and um, he had programmed this computer screen to like randomly kind of select a photograph so he wouldn't know what that picture, that image was going to be. I think he got somebody else to program it so he didn't know what imagery there was going to be and it just kind of landed on one image. And that was the image that the water was exposed to for a period of time. And then it was frozen, and then he would go ahead and use my technique. And a week into it, he rang me. He's like, nothing's really happening, just seeing normal lines. I don't really see anything happening at all much. And this is like in a clean room, and it's very clinically done. And I'm like, well, I was thinking I'm not really that surprised <laughs> because I was really feeling uncomfortable with the water being used as an, in this experimental way because I had an attachment to that water, an emotional attachment or connection perhaps. There's a big difference between attachment and connection. But I definitely had a, an emotional connection between myself and that water he was using. So a few days after that, just before he was about to end this whole thing, he rang me and he said, okay, there is definitely an image that I can see. I, even I can recognize it. It's pretty clear, but it doesn't match the image on the computer screen. And I'm like, okay, well, what was the image on the computer screen? And he said, 
the image is of a human heart in one of those stainless steel kind of like, hospital dishes. And I'm like, oh, okay, so like, what's, what are you seeing in the eyes? And he sent me a photograph. It is a, a picture of two eyes, a nose, and a sad face, and a sort of circle around it, just like a sad emoji. And in that moment, I'm like, oh my God, this message in water, can look at, especially when you compare it to the, what's on the screen, is saying, where is your heart? Because that heart wasn't in a human body, it was in a dish. And water in its emotional expression of that is saying, where is your heart? And the guy, the, the scientist, he was like, well, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. But that was as far as it went. And he went on to do his thing and that was it. And I was quite pleased about that because it made me feel really resolved to continue doing this in the way that I am, continue to have this emotional connection with water and to keep that growing because I don't want to control anything in this situation. I, it's, it really is a love story. You know, people, they, they often say to me, you know, but if you are projecting a really deep emotional thought or a feeling or something into water or you're trying to get into a meditative state and what if there's like other stuff going on in the room? What if the phone rings or what if somebody comes in or will that like affect the water? People also ask me, well, will it affect the water if there's heaps of stuff in my freezer, like the peas and the ice cream and the whatever it is in the freezer? Just so people know, it doesn't matter if there's tons of stuff in your freezer. I like to have an allocated space, but it isn't required. Anything that's frozen is a state of suspension. It's not in a state of influence. But the love story part is that when you form a bond with this fluid intelligence, it's much like when you go out on a date and with somebody you really like, for example, and you're really excited to get to know them, get to hear their voice, get to see them. And you go out for dinner and there's loads of people in the restaurant and the waiter or the waitress comes to serve you and lots of other things are going on. But your attention and your focus, your energy is directed to that person you're so interested in. And when it's given back, you're both in this kind of state of relationship. And so when I am working in this area and space with water, it doesn't matter what the heck goes on in my kitchen or in my lounge or with the children or whatever is there because the relationship has become so bonded and so strong. And this lady once told me she worked with a lot of Indigenous people. I think she had an Indigenous background. And she was saying that she would observe hives, beehives, for a long time. And she said she, she was able to understand different beings. She could understand trees and she could understand bees. They just happened to rhyme. And the bees, uh, one of the bees came out and expressed to her the concerns that the other bees were having. And the bee said, can you please stop looking at our hive for so long? We don't mind if you watch us, but don't look at us for too long because your consciousness is creating too much light in our hive. And what interested me about that, and she said the same thing with the tree, that she said the, the tree didn't mind the extra light, but expressed to her that consciousness creates light in things when you apply it directly into something or someone. And so with this relationship with water, and because this informed water seems to go into that fourth phase. One of the characteristics of fourth phase water is that it's got an ability to absorb more light. And so when you start forming this relationship, there is this kind of bonding that happens through conscious awareness and connection that seems to give the water more ability to absorb information through adding more light into it. So within that realm, there is this emotional love and kind of relationship where it teaches you also about not staying in the, the that ego of control. So water simply won't play with me or design in this complex way if I 
expect to see something. If I have this idea, oh, I know exactly what it's going to do, it simply won't do it or it will do something I don't imagine. And if I am in a state of like real tension or frustration, which occasionally happens, I've learned not to even bother doing any of the work with water when I'm feeling like that. But on the occasion, I've felt the pressure to do something for somebody else and I've just gone ahead and it just refused. It was like just a no go. Water will not respond to a lesser vibration. So I don't have to be all spiritual and all lovey lovey and everything all the time. I just be me because my nature is, I have a kind nature and my nature is to simply do this work because I feel like I'm actually in a kind of devotional service to this spiritual teacher that is water. So whatever it's revealing to me, then it's up to me to help reveal it to others in whatever shape, form or way I can. Because it's not for no reason that water is revealing this intelligence at this time. So I, I think that in, the, in that respect, the relationship that I have formed with water reflects the relationship I've had to form with myself in the process of this. I have had to literally learn more and more and more about what it is to love others and love myself in this process. Because when you really love someone, when you really love someone, you don't own them. You don't want to change them. We are in acceptance of exactly who they are. And when you are the most vulnerable and transparent that you can be as a person, it allows the other person to feel that they can be just as vulnerable and transparent with you. And in that way, in that kind of destruction of walls and masks and ego, comes this real essence of light, of who we really, truly are and want to share. Because we're so afraid of what others may think. We're so afraid of being judged for what we've done or what we've thought or who we think we are. But when we're able to kind of shed that and be seen, because that is one thing you can know for sure, is that water sees you past all of the bullshit, it absolutely sees you and it is not in judgment. It is not in judgment. And when you feel that type of and level of love and acceptance, it allows me to be exactly that reflection back. You know, we still got time left, but normally that would be a great place to cut this chat just all together. <laughs> but we're going to keep going because you actually flowed really well into some points that I wanted to share as well about my my own sort of emotional journey because I've done some extensive shadow work, which actually is kind of like trauma work, right? It's That's, a, I think, what we're talking about. Is I, so I've done some extensive trauma work the last few years of my life. And, you know, through learning about the trauma healing process, you learn about the trauma storage process or trauma imprints, right? The idea that the the physical body stores trauma, which is information. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I, you know, really dug into your work over the last year or so that I first heard about you that I realized that what's actually happening is that those water molecules that we keep talking about, that's what's storing this in my body, right? It's storing that information. And it really does, I think, speak to this intelligent creator this intelligent design of this substance and and storing all that information that you've had imprinted on you your entire life and maybe even i guess absorbing some of that from your parents and then their parents and then their parents and it's just this constant stream i guess of information storage that just gets imprinted on you you know from like a genetic standpoint right mm -hmm. and so i actually want to tell you a quick story it's very personal very vulnerable of me to talk about this but I think that it speaks to this idea of water and emotion, or maybe that we're being called by water itself to heal. I have a, a very close friend. Actually, we're not really friends anymore. We're at least in the everyday sense. You know, we had a complicated relationship and just don't speak at all. But the last few years that we were hanging out, you know, our relationship took on this watery theme in a literal sense where we would meet up and take walks along rivers and lakes just talking and enjoying nature and each other's company. And I started to catch on 
in real time that the water was meaningful to us and to our dynamic for some reason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're both very emotionally honest people, very like emotionally intelligent. But I was wondering, you know, if, if the water wasn't just drawing us into it in order to facilitate something between us, some sort of change, some sort of transformation, because we had a shared trauma many years ago. So maybe you have some insight into the role that, that water can play in people's lives or relationships like this. Does it call us to it to facilitate some sort of healing process? I believe so. One of the first things that many people do when they've really gone through trauma and they're kind of at that point where they need to clear their head is one thing that might be said, is if they can, they'll go for a walk along the beach. And when you go for that walk along the beach, that constant rhythm of the sea and all those negative ions are starting to clear our mindset to allow us to just kind of breathe for the first time after you've gone through a lot of trauma. We always sort of have this kind of feeling of holding our breath. It's like we go into fight or flight. And then that rhythmic aspect of the water and the ocean helps us to come out of fight or flight. It helps us to finally kind of find some kind of more like relaxing space. But also water as the giant observer of life. You know, if you're drawn to these places together to go to streams and rivers and lakes and the beach, water is in those moments. Like I said, there is this, it's kind of like an omnisensory and omnipresent substance. It's hearing what you're talking about. It's really seeing you both. And I believe that it's, we're drawn to those places when we need to release, when we need to kind of feel like we're being seen. And when it's amplified, when there's two of you which have shared something really deep and shared something that can be, has been traumatic. You know, that, that kind of idea of someone is witnessing that, something is witnessing you. There is something within that that can really be very, very bonding and very healing and very sharing. Even just bathing in water once, like when I've had a, a long day or felt lots of things going on, I find that when I go into the shower and I just let water just run over my body, run over my hair, like just, it, it has this ability to just kind of, decompress we can decompress when we're in water there's a reason for that because water is the ultimate kind of womb even when we lie back in a bath and we immerse ourselves completely in the bath one of the first things that happens to us when that happens is we hear our heartbeat we hear our heart beating so strongly in our ears and the longer you're in there, the louder that heart is beating. And you're not hearing it in your chest, you're hearing it in your ears. And it is that water moving through us, reminding us that there is this essence within us that is beating our heart, that all of those things that we take for granted, that we don't even think about, like breathing, is all going on within this body. And it brings us into our body because trauma can take us out of it. So it is something that... I think water is a powerful healer because it does bring you back into that safe place which kind of embraces us and takes us inward and helps us to, to calm ourselves. Because trauma takes, literally I've seen it in so many different people, it does, we, a part of us disconnects and we kind of just, we're not completely within our body really bad trauma, someone kind of goes completely out of their body and is not really fully present within there. It's just too difficult. It's too hard. But that simple act of immersing yourself back into the bath and being connected into that simple rhythm, that heartbeat, that nurturing, mothering place, it is a very healing thing that can happen. And water really has the ability to draw you back into your body. And I think that that's an important thing because I think in going even a little further, I don't know how long we have, but I've spent some years now doing a separate study on eggs, on various different bird eggs, because I always thought, what would be most informed in, a, in the human body? 
a fluid that would be so informed, and I thought it would have to be amniotic fluid because in ancient times, water wasn't called water. It was called the waters. It was revered. And it went from the waters to water to H2O. And when you look back now and you think about when somebody is about to give birth, we say her waters broke, the waters broke. It's still considered sacred, it's still revered. And so I thought, well, I, it's, it's not possible right now for me to get some amniotic fluid from pregnant ladies or wait until their waters births and say, hey, can I, can I have some of that? So I thought, well, the next best thing would be an egg. And so I started to freeze albumin. And I, I discovered something really interesting. And I know that no one else has done this. I've, I've taught it even at the Pollock Lab, people, how to do this. An egg, for example, is a very good thing to use because it's contained. So when there's a certain part of the egg white or the egg albumin that when frozen reveals six different specific patterns and they're very beautiful. One I called like the volcano. They're 3D as well. Like they're amazing. One's like the flower, the hexagon, the pollen, the weave. There's six. But they only show up in free-range chicken eggs or free-range bird eggs. If I use an egg that has been taken from a factory or, you know, one of those places where they cage the chickens and they never actually ever see the light of day or they never know what grass feels like, they have been in trauma their whole lives. I only see between one to two patterns show up in their egg albumin. And so all of this, this is a very condensed version of the study, suggests that those patterns, that information in the albumin, and this isn't the, the part of the albumin that, that is protein for the bird, this is a part of the albumin which looks and feels more like saliva. It could be some kind of information for the growing um, embryo, but it could also be a type of ancestral way ancestral information is passed down. And because I see it form in patterns, and they're very specific, I was wondering if I use a different species, say a crocodile or a snake egg, and I saw different patterns consistently show up in the way it does for bird eggs, then that could easily be a study worth investigating further because it's suggesting that the albumin of eggs holds and stores, whether it's amniotic fluid from a human an egg or those jelly-like things that the frogs lay, all these things, everything is conceived in some kind of a liquid. And within that liquid is information. And within that information, it could possibly be handed, like passed down ancestral information. And when I think about all of that, then it kind of makes sense with what you're saying around the idea that perhaps trauma can also be passed down. And I also think that it doesn't have to stay that way. I think as we get to understand how our body works, as we get to understand water more, I think things like going into those freezing spaces, consciously aware that that water, the water within you, everything will slow down. And you have this ability to have a kind of a reset when water completely freezes, it's in a state of suspension. But when it's freezing, it's in a state of creation. So in those spaces, you can, in your mind, actually go through a cleansing, kind of going through a, a metamorphosis of going from trauma into a place where you can create what you want and have that kind of calm space where you can, at the very least, take the that emotional pain and tr transmute it into something different. I think that, that there is the ability within water to transmute from one stage to another. And I think that within human beings, we also have the ability to change from one stage to another because we're kind of water and frequency and light and, and movement. So we are this very complex sophisticated system of water 
flowing through this body that we attach ourselves to. And it is, of course, absolutely possible to heal ourselves because I see, I see it happen all the time within water. I see it happen in myself. I too have gone through a lot of trauma. And the more I see from the perspective of the observer, which is the perspective of water, the less in judgment I am of anything. And that has been one of the most helpful tools that water has gifted to me over these years, is that the more I observe myself going through the various different emotions that we all go through on various different scales, in my observing space, I'm simply thinking, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why you're reacting like that. I wonder why you're responding like that. I wonder what that is. And if I know what it is, I'm like, I just observe it. And there is a power in this idea that there is a witness to that, that we're being seen in those times of vulnerability and those times of reactiveness. And then you get to this point where there's inner engineering where we actually have a choice of how we're going to respond to that. And in those spaces is where we really find our true strength, where we're going, actually, I will say right now to this person, right now I'm feeling really vulnerable. And my, my habit is to either go into my shell and say I'm fine when I'm not fine, or my habit is to push you away because this feels like something I've felt before. But I don't want to do that because I don't want to be that anymore. I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to stand in my power. I want to stand in my vulnerability because power and vulnerability are actually hand in hand. And I want to show you that I want to change, that I am feeling this way because of this. It's not your fault. My habit is to do this. But here I am <laughs> in all the complexities of my life and I just want to love you and I don't want to project my stuff onto you and I want to learn to love myself. And so by voicing it out, I have found that is one of the most powerful things to do because we don't have to do what we've always done and what comes naturally as a reaction. We don't have to do that, but it takes a lot of courage to actually be vulnerable enough to say, this isn't your fault. I am responding to something that happened a long time ago and this is where I'm at. You say it out loud, it, it really does kind of dilute. And it is that, that term again, it's very watery. There is a dilution of the concentrated pain when we share it, when we speak it. And in the observa observations of myself in all of these different times, I feel like I'm not being judged and I'm not judging myself and I find that I have the space and the calmness to actually be very raw and honest about what I'm going through rather than just reacting and doing what I've always done, which will give us the same result as we've always done. Water has taught me all of these things. So you're talking, and I, I can't help but think of like what you said earlier, too. You know, we're talking about emotion and, and trauma now, and you mentioned earlier the synergy between salt and water, and it makes me think of what happens when we actually you know, get sad and try to release some of that as we cry. We form tears, which is a, a salty, watery discharge. And I'm curious, like, what you think about tears, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. What, like, well, what are they the for? Oh, good. Sorry. No, that's fine. No, well, for me, tears are a reminder that we're not alone. Tears are a, a, a liquid representation of our emotions. Try to describe an, an emotion. What, what is, like, love? What is hate? What are all these things, like, that we feel? They're so much more difficult to explain. We can say why we feel them, but to actually explain what they are, what they are is very difficult. Because we always have to explain what happened to make us feel like that. But how do you explain a feeling? But what you're seeing in tears, whether they're joyful or sad, is actual emotion in liquid form. Those tears are emotions, what they look like. Because you've had such a tidal wave of emotions that it's actually pushed that water out of you. 
to actually hold tears is seeing your emotion in your hands. That's what tears to me represent. Do you think then that they are also on some level, is it a release or like a purging of excess emotional or sensory info? Well, I think that most people can say that they feel better once they've had a good cry. So it is ultimately releasing a lot of that tension that it's built up inside of our bodies. And so with crying, it is such a gift because, you know, those tears are literally a way in which all of that tension that, like I said, water doesn't like to be in that state of frustration. And frustration usually stems, you know, from not having got something you wanted or someone you wanted or something hasn't worked out the way you wanted it. Sadness can come from all these different reasons or just whatever the thing is. Sometimes we just need a good cry and we can't even say exactly what the thing is. It's just that we just, we just feel emotional. That emotional release through the gift of tears is a way in which we are shedding so much of that tension that's, that's, which too much in the body. Our body can only cope with so much. And so tears are a way in which, uh, which that release actually happens to help us come back into some kind of equilibrium of some kind where we can where we can just kind of pick ourselves up and go okay I can keep going forward now because water is always going back to source it's taking us back to source those tears are a reminder of this kind of fluid emotion emotional being that we are so for me I think tears are very representative of fluid emotion and of what has come out of us because we've so filled up that it can't stay in us any longer. It's it's kind of like we use the, the term of emotions as like we have waves of emotion. We it feels like there's like this tidal wave of emotion coming out of us sometimes. Sometimes, you know, we can be very still. And in those still moments is when we can see our reflections. We, you know, it's like for me, when I go into a meditative space, I always go to the space where I'm looking into the still pool. And within that still pool, I see something reflected, whether it's in my face or whether it's something else. But there is something that is very telling about looking within water that is still compared to looking at water as it's rough. We can see so much more. So as we become more mindful and more meditative and more still, we can see more because in water still water will show us more clear water will show us the most clear still water will show us our true reflection so i think it's all very representative of us being bodies of water so you may have already answered this question throughout the last couple hours we've been chatting but i want to ask it anyways we started the chat with me asking you what water is, what intelligence is, and I like to do this thing sometimes at the end of these chats with these final questions where I ask people a similar what is question. And so I'd like to pose it to you, you know, Veda, what is love and what does it have to do with all of this? That's a big question. I think, though, that love is learning to love your own reflection because ultimately what I keep seeing is that water is always in search of itself, observing itself from every perspective. And as the observer, we are not in judgment. And one of the most beautiful things I have seen recently is that the other day my daughter had written something and put a, put a, a little note for herself on the mirror. She's 11. And she wrote a note to herself and it said, I am beautiful. I am kind. I love myself. And when I saw that, that touched me. If we could see ourselves in the way that we truly want to be seen by others, in the way in which we truly want to see ourselves, in the way that we really are, I think that that love, that intangible thing that we've 
only feel, we can feel, it can be actually really understood in that little thing that she did. I think that that love is something of which is not just something that we feel, but something that we really are. Something that we, that we, the more we truly, truly get to love the essence of who we are, we see less of the body, we see less of the mind, we hear less of the chatter in our mind, and we actually become a moving, non-judgmental observer of life, when you take out the judgment, and my mother, she she didn't bring me up religiously or philosophically, she didn't do any of that. She taught me one thing. She said, just learn not to judge, not to judge others or to judge yourself, and you will find love like you've never found love before in that one thing. And so to see my daughter write those things on her mirror, when she looked in the mirror, it reminded me that we are all mirrors of each other and that if we are going to hate another person because they're not doing something that suits us or that we like or that's not in resonance with us, it's good to look into ourselves and see what it is that's creating that dislike, creating this disharmony, creating that feeling and look within us and say, why, why is that being reflected to me right now? Because everything is a reflection. And right now, I get the opportunity to see you, to speak to you and hear your story and hear the things that you've shared that are vulnerable. And in those spaces, I can say that I see you in a way in which I think you are bringing forth something within you which has so much so much power, so much power to share to others and so much power that forces and flows through your body. And you in this moment are my reflection too. The more we learn to love ourselves, the more we see love in others and we see beautiful things in other people and we see the good and we see all these things. People say to me, you've just got New Zealand goggles on. Well, right now, you should see New Zealand. New Zealand is not in a great space. It is quite divided right now with some of the political things that are going on there. And yet, if we actually learn to do the work and we get to see things from that non-judgmental point of view, we can see that everyone is actually just doing the best they can with the tools they have. And it's so easy to be taken out of a loving vibration through judgment. I just think that more I see, the more I work with water, this beautiful spiritual teacher that I see is teaching me that stay as much in the observer space as you can. And through that space, we learn to actually love who we are and others the way they are because we're not sitting there judging them or ourselves for the way in which we live our lives. Well, Veda. <laughs> I had a couple of notes around emotion and spirituality and, and love like this, but this conversation went in a completely different direction than I anticipated. But I think ultimately we've gotten to a point of such vulnerability and beauty and our own sort of co-creation here has become something that I, this is one of the, my favorite conversations I've ever recorded. And I appreciate you bringing, you know, that vulnerability and that part of yourself to this chat because I, not sure you may have anticipated that either. So the fact that you were open and receptive to creating this with me, just much, much gratitude, seriously. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I, and I think that that's, that's the thing. You inspired that. And so the best things happen when you least expect them. <laughs> that much I know is true. And that's why I always have to stay in that space when it comes with water, because I can't control those things. And I know it's true. The best co-creations happen when you don't expect them, when there's no pressure, when there's no expectation. Yeah, 100% for real. So before we go then, tell people where they can keep up with you and your work. So I teach my technique now. I've recently started doing that. So 
people can sign up to go on my workshops, which is on my website, which is vedaaustin.com. You can also get my technique there. I've shared lots of photos of my work, all kinds of information, lots of podcasts, lots of videos, all kinds of stuff. I've tried to make it as informative as I can for people. And also, uh, I share almost daily on Instagram, which is vedaaustin underscore water, and on Facebook, which is Veda Austin Water Researcher, or at Water Researcher, I think. So I should know that for sure, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. <laughs> you, you'll find me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll put it in the show notes for anybody uh, who you. wants to, to click through from there. So seriously, thank you so much. I am eternally just impressed by your work and grateful that you've made the time here to talk about it. And just to reiterate, to go to the depths of emotion that we've that we've went to here, it was it was quite enjoyable for me. Oh, and for me too. It's um, it's a, a wonderful reflection. Thank you so much. And there you have it. My thanks again to Veda Austin. Be sure to check out her work either in her book or on her social media channels, which are all linked in the show notes. And whether or not that was pure sex to you, well, I guess you know by now if it was or wasn't. But to me, it absolutely was because of that intimacy and vulnerability that built up to and through that latter half of the chat there. That's also where Veda made a rather insightful comment about how water used to be known as the waters and now is just H2O. And that's quite the scientific reduction of what water really is if you think about it. It's just H2O or H3O2 if you're aware of Dr. Gerald Pollack's work. And while overstanding it on that level serves a purpose in the scientism cult, It doesn't do much in the way of overstanding or understanding the tremendous qualities that water has beyond its molecular makeup, the qualities that Veda so artistically and beautifully captures in her work. So next time you take a drink, sit with your water, bless your water, thank it for all the years of nourishment and sustenance it's provided you, and I'm serious, do this. Blessing your water is now mandated by me which means you have to do it, because it's a mandate and I said so. I'd also mandate that you pursue the work of Dr. Pollock in the fourth phase of water, which was noted by Veda a couple of times in the chat. And you know what's funny? I was actually trading emails with Dr. Pollock about three years ago, and we had an interview booked, and we had to indefinitely postpone the chat, and I never followed back up with him. But if you're interested in me trying to book him, let me know in the Telegram channel which is also linked in the show notes. Now, if seeking out Dr. Pollock's work is too much work, you can download episode 29 of the O'Culture podcast with Dan Willis, where we talked about, among other things, the work of Marcel Vogel and the geometry and structure of water, which was also noted here in the chat with Veda. And that conversation with Dan was actually one of my favorites of the old O'Culture project, for what it's worth. But that's old news, and here we are with something new, which means all that old stuff has to be purged and cleared out. That's why I said at the beginning, fuck Zoom, and also fuck Patreon. I'm not trying to use platforms that censor its creators. Patreon has deplatformed a few folks, and I just can't abide that. Well, okay, I'm still on YouTube, and that's, I guess, the exception to the rule. But I also have video versions available on Odyssey and BitChute and Rumble. I'd also like to get on Rockfin, but they haven't accepted me yet, so we'll see. The Detox website is also live now at Detox.com. And then there's the Substack, which on the surface looks like just a blogging platform, but it also has the ability to upload podcast episodes, and it's super easy to use both on my end and on your end. And they support free speech, which I guess suddenly has to be taken into account. So Substack is where all the bonus content will reside henceforth, detox.substack.com is the place to be there dtoxxxx and for seven bucks a month you'll get access to the second hour of every episode from here on out plus exclusive bonus content some writing whenever i get around to it and discounted merch when i get around to that too now if you're already subbed on substack as a free subscriber listen to this this is for you i will not be posting the free versions of the podcast on there You can find those on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts or on the website, detox.com, or on some of those video platforms I mentioned. But on Substack itself, I will only be posting the paid versions of these conversations. 
The reason is logistical. So I hope you understand that, and I hope you level up to the paid subscription so you can get the full story that our guests will tell each and every time, because that's what these episodes are. They're stories, and you're only getting half of the story if you're not subscribed. Imagine only watching the first four episodes of your favorite eight-episode Netflix limited series. That's what you're missing out on here. Also, cancel your fucking Netflix. Subscribe to this instead. You won't miss it, trust me. And I promise better audio quality. I've already invested in a better way to record with guests both locally and in the cloud. I actually just recorded another episode and it turned out really well. And that's where your money goes to help me improve every aspect of this show and to help free my time up to do more of them for you. Because it's not about me. It's about you. I'm back on this mic because of you. You emailed me. You DM'd me. I read them all. I think I responded to them all. And if I miss someone, I apologize. And, I mean, I don't want to get into, like, every reason why I stopped doing this before. Although, if you made it this far, you got a bit of an indication as to why during this chat with Veda. But another reason was that a full-time job, on top of doing this to the level that I wanted to do it, which is another full-time job, was just too much work for one living man. So, I like to think I learned a valuable lesson in how to balance all this. Maybe even outsource some stuff, if and when I can. Which I don't like to do, because that also costs money, and I'm a Scorpio kind of a control freak but it's all about working smarter these days and also working harder because we have a new world to build together fellow living men and living women so anything you can contribute to my version of the great reset here so that i can build back better well it's much appreciated and i promise no more klaus schwabisms because fuck all that noise and speaking of noise i'm done making it i gotta make like ice and chill till the next episode until then you know what to do Love yourself, think for yourself, and reclaim authority. Authority.